and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast where we take a wander through the glens of Scottish history, mythology and nature. I'm Jenny, an environmental scientist. And I'm Annie, an archivist and historian. Last week we looked at the Battle of Culloden and we're returning again to look at the aftermath of this infamous battle. If you haven't already listened, it would be worth heading back and catching up now. This episode does come with a warning. It contains some very graphic accounts of the events and this is the first time I've had to mark an episode as being explicit. I do think it's important that we tell the history of the aftermath of Culloden in its entirety, but there is a trigger warning with this episode. We're going to include descriptions of violence, murder and rape. Out of respect for the weight of the topics we're speaking about this week, we're not going to have any of our usual humour in this episode, but our next episode will be more light-hearted, we promise. But until then, here's a quick recap of where we left off last episode. We have two armies, the Jacobites under the command of Bonnie Prince Charlie, the mixed European prince from Italy, who along with his army of Scottish clans, Scots, Irish and English soldiers is attempting to reclaim the British crown in the name of the House of Stuart. Many of the Jacobite troops are simply fighting because they oppose the Act of Union, which has made them poorer as it has cut off key trading partners in Europe, a story as old as time. On the other side at Culloden we had the British government army, commanded by the Hanoverian king's youngest son, the Duke of Cumberland. With his win at Culloden, he hopes he has squashed the last hope of any Stuart rule returning to the British throne and fully remove any competition for his family. On the 16th of April 1746, these armies charged into battle at Culloden, but the war pipes and musket smoke didn't last long. In less than an hour from the initial artillery being fired, the Jacobite forces were defeated. And amongst the mayhem, Prince Charles escaped and fled. We'll be covering his journey through Scotland in the next episode. The proud victors of the Battle of Culloden are the Hanoverian army. But what they do to their already defeated enemy is truly horrific. Culloden is one of the most emotive places in the Scottish Highlands. It really isn't about the battle itself, but the aftermath that has shaped so much of Highland life in the following centuries. Ultimately, the aftermath of Culloden is a story of power. Who can have it and who can't? It becomes about power being taken away from the Highland folks, in far-reaching laws that prevent them from going back to their clan-based communities, but also in more intricate and subtle oppressions that strip them of the power of their traditions and culture. It's a rough journey to look at the aftermath of Culloden, but it's also very important. And it does help us to understand this place. For me, as someone who grew up in the Highlands and has ancestry going back in the Highlands, it's one of the narratives that I can never forget about this land. We're returning to Dromossi Moor on the 16th of April, 1746. The Battle of Culloden is over, the sounds of cannon and war pipes are long gone. We're faced with a scene of slaughter. About 1,500 Jacobites have been killed in the battle and their bodies are left on the moor. The Jacobite leader, Bonnie Prince Charlie, has been led away from the battle by his guards. To begin with, let's talk a little bit about mercy. Jenny, are you familiar with the military phrase to give no quarter? Surprisingly, Annie, I am. If an army is told to give no quarter, it means to show no clemency or no mercy at all. The victor isn't going to preserve any life or take any prisoners. They want the enemy annihilated. Exactly. There was a rumour that the Jacobite army had been told to give no quarter to the Hanoverian troops had they won. This is important to remember. 
because the Hanoverian troops instead have just won the Battle of Culloden, and they are now being told that had the situation been reversed, all of their wounded and surrendered troops would be killed. But Annie, this is just a rumour, so how accurate is it? Because it isn't in any of the archives of the Jacobites. The leader of the British government army, the Duke of Cumberland, told his troops, Officers and men, be aware that the public order of the rebels yesterday was to give us no quarter. But it isn't in any of their public orders though, so where did the Duke get this from? One of the leaders of the Jacobite army, Lord George Murray, had sent orders through a letter. Now this letter had been found in the pocket of a Highland officer. However, the statement about giving no quarter, about giving no mercy at all, was actually a crude forgery that had been added on to the letter. If you speculate about it, it could have easily been added by one of Cumberland's officers. So Cumberland is telling his army that the Jacobites would have given them no mercy. So the Hanoverians decide that the Jacobite army also deserves no mercy either. But this is based on a forgery, a, a lie, and reduces the honour of their enemy. Because if they are seen as barbarians, then why not treat them so? The British government army are out for revenge against the Jacobite army, to completely cut them down. Yes, this is a feeling of the Hanoverian army as they approach the wounded Jacobites lying abandoned on Culloden battlefield, of which there were many. The British army set out and hunted the battlefield wounded with contempt and bloodlust. We know the weapons that were used at Culloden, cannon, artillery, bayonets and muskets, they do a tremendous deal of damage to the human body, but they don't necessarily kill outright. So Jacobite men, with their limbs shattered or bodies maimed, lay on Culloden Moor, surrounded by the sickening stench of death. A general named Henry Holly led the execution squads around Dramossi Moor to kill the wounded. He ordered his men to bayonet any Jacobites found alive, rather than incur the expense of musket powder. That's how much their lives meant to them. I feel this says so much about the Hanoverian army, that they can have an enemy defeated and still approach the wounded on the battlefield, probably men slipping in and out of consciousness, and choose an execution method that is based on cost efficiency. For me, this seems like a very symbolic foreshadowing of the atrocities that are to be committed on the Highlands in the decades to come. When I imagine the blood-soaked heather of Culloden Battlefield, I think of these bayonets on wounded men, as much as I think of those who died in combat. An officer in the British Army reported on this bloodlust. The moor was covered with blood, and our men were killing the enemy, dabbling their feet in the blood, and splashing it about on one another. Our men looked more like butchers than Christian soldiers. It's just... It's horrendous to imagine men splashing blood on each other, like it's a game, like it's an amusement. I find this heartbreaking because the Battle of Culloden really divided Scotland as a nation, to the point that there would be family members on each side, just in different armies. And with the inhumanity of the aftermath, something is severed and you still feel it when you visit Culloden, even after 275 years, the earth just feels sorrowful and you can tell that something really dark happened here. And yet, General Hawley's efforts weren't complete, because the government burial parties reported that many wounded Jacobites remained on Culloden Moor when night set in, slowly and painfully bleeding to death. In the aftermath of Culloden, the men of the Jacobite army were treated as subhuman. The propaganda of the British government Hanoverians completely dehumanised the Highlanders within the Jacobite army. They were described as uncouth savages, hungry wolves and bare arse banditti. By dehumanising the Highlanders in this way, the British government perhaps are trying to justify the brutalities that happen in the aftermath of Culloden. 
This is how they give grounds for the oppression of the Gales and Highland folks with treatment that would otherwise be seen as completely morally depraved, disgraceful and shameful. They viewed the Highlanders as lesser people, subhumans, and treated them as so. From those bleeding on the battlefield and through into the summer of 1746, Hanoverian troops set to work and desolated the lives and the culture of the Gales and Highlanders. We know a lot about what happened after Culloden, because a man named Robert Forbes risked everything to go around collecting first-hand accounts from witnesses who had seen this brutality in action. He put this together in a collection called The Lion in Mourning, Jacobite Memoirs. The waxing crescent moon shone down on the gloaming twilight of the 16th of April. Some of the wounded Highlanders around the battlefield are stripped by beggars. Warriors are left in blood and heather, languishing in agony. Some manage to get themselves to sanctuaries, bothies or shelters or nearby villages, anywhere that they could hide. Let's briefly follow the story of one such soldier. John Fraser, who was also known as John MacIver, had fought with the Jacobites in the Lovett Regiment. John Fraser took a musket ball to his knee during the initial Highland charge at Culloden and fell wounded. He couldn't retreat or escape when it was obvious that the Jacobites had lost. He was discovered by a rival Clan Campbell, who had fought for the British government army. They merrily robbed him and stripped him, leaving him alive but severely wounded. Their clan rivalry and orders from Cumberland enabled them to humiliate him. Under the cover of night, he managed to drag himself down from Dermosse Moor towards the shelter of Culloden House. Here, he was given a little food and water, but was in a miserable condition with his undressed wounds. This sanctuary did not last long. We know that 18 Jacobite soldiers were found by the Hanoverian burial parties in the shelter of Culloden House three days after the battle ended. John Fraser, or MacIver, was amongst them. These 18 men were bound with ropes and forced into a cart. Perhaps they imagined they would be taken away as prisoners. However, the cart stopped abruptly by a stone wall. Here, they were put before a firing squad, who told them to prepare for death. Many of the Jacobite soldiers bowed their heads in prayer. They were shot down from a range of two metres. Robert Forbes writes that after the firing squad, the soldiers were ordered to bash about the heads of anyone who showed any sign of life, to beat their brains out. John Fraser was still breathing, so a Hanoverian soldier struck him on the head with his musket, breaking John's cheek, nose and piercing his eye. Shockingly, our John survived this second shooting and following beating and crawled out naked and bloody, surrounded by the bodies of his fallen comrades. He was spotted by a young noble, Lord Boyd, who was out riding on his horse. After discovering that John had fought in the Jacobite army, Boyd should have reported him to the Hanoverians. But instead, he took pity on the wounded soldier. Lord Boyd offered him aid, even offering him his own money. John Fraser refused the money, but he did ask Lord Boyd to either take him to a nearby mill where he knew he would be safe, hidden and could recover, or to ask his servant to put an end to his miserable life. Lord Boyd was shocked by the request, yet also sick of the death that surrounded him and saw no need for any more blood spill. He asked his servant to carry John to safety. Inside the mill, John hid under a kiln for three months as he recovered from his wounds. When he came out of hiding, local people saw him as a living reminder of the brutalities of Culloden. John Fraser survived, and his story is a dismal but an exceptional one. When we look at the days after Culloden, it's the attitude of the Hanoverian soldiers that we see again and again that it's easier to kill their enemies than to take any prisoners or to give any pretense of justice or any mercy at all. 
their approach to the survivors of Culloden was one of no mercy, and it extended more broadly to the local Highlanders. This has been by far the darkest episode we've made, but unfortunately the brutality continues. You see, the British government army weren't content with just destroying the Jacobite army. They wanted to wreck and ravage the Highlands, so that Highlanders could never rebel and threaten their power again. And so, in the summer of 1746, after Culloden, history witnesses cold-blooded and violent atrocities against the Gales and Highland people. The Duke of Cumberland, the man whose officers committed these offences, was known as Sweet William by his supporters. He was named as Commander-in-Chief of Forces in Scotland in July 1746. Many believe the dainty star-shaped flower Sweet William is named in his honour. However, his opponents would call him the Butcher, a name that is still used for him to this day. Highlanders themselves named a plant after him, a poisonous weed called the Stinking Willy, which we know as Ragwort. The summer of 1746 was dreadful for the people of the Highlands because of the actions of the Duke of Cumberland's forces. Cumberland's troops set about their cruel work to control the Highlands from ever rising up against the British government again. Let's start with one of his subordinates, Major Lockhart. Major Lockhart was marching his troops out of Fort William on the west coast, into the territory of the Grants of Glen Morriston. On the road, they saw two old men and one of their sons were working in a field, quietly tending to their crops. At this time of year, they would maybe have been weeding this crop or tending to their cattle. These three men were Highland farmers, working away and assuming that they were in no danger. Without hesitation, Lockhart's men shot them with no warning or reason. Then, going further than this cold-blooded murder, the troops decided to make these three farmers a symbol of the inferiority of Highlanders. And so they took their bodies and carried them to the nearby settlement, where they hung them up by their feet on makeshift gallows. The names of these murdered farmers were Hugh Fraser, James Fraser and John MacDonald. James Fraser was about 18 years old. Lockhart then decided to claim the cows belonging to Grant of Dundregan and told Dundregan that they were going to take them as their own. Old man Dundregan had been offered protection with a letter of indemnity and had been assured safety in his land. He took this letter to the soldiers, requesting his right to live a quiet, undisturbed life with his cattle. Grant and Dundregan had not fought at Culloden and he was no Jacobite and he had been offered immunity. The cattle were taken nevertheless. And because the cows took a long time to herd, Lockhart decided to humiliate Dundregan. The British troops stripped him naked, tied him up and whipped him as they took him to view the corpses of the men killed earlier, strung up by their feet. Grant of Dundregan's wife was also taunted and humiliated as the troops robbed her of her clothes and stole the rings off her fingers. As she tried to resist the troops stealing her rings, they threatened to cut off her fingers. Lockhart got caught up in the killing frenzy and almost hung up Grant of Dundregan and his wife. But one of the officers in his militia, Captain Grant, stepped up and intervened. Instead, the British government soldiers looted the home of Grant of Dundregan of everything valuable and set it alight until it burnt to the ground. Their method of oppressing the Highland folks was to leave them with nothing but trauma and pain. It's despicable. Whole clachans, villages, were burnt to ashes. Livestock stolen, slaughtered or chased away. It's suspected that many of the crimes against the people of the Highlands by the British government troops under Cumberland were never reported. Well, I suppose when it's the troops of the government in charge who are the ones shooting, looting and murdering you, there's not really much hope in reporting the savage treatment that you're being subjected to. One of the most difficult, horrendous reports I read was that of the woman Isabel MacDonald. 
It described that at the point where the River Doe meets the River Marveston in a dark waterfall, Isabel MacDonald was raped repeatedly by a group of soldiers. I've not really got much information about Isabel MacDonald as a person. She was simply described as a gentlewoman, which means that she would have been respected in her area. She was married and of childbearing age, a Gaelic speaker who probably wouldn't have spoken much English, the main language of the British government troops. She could have been any woman and, and my heart just breaks for what she must have gone through. Her husband, Alexander MacDonald, was forced to hide high in the heather and watch on as the violent attack took place in what must have been agony. Because the troops were so casual about killing men, he would be shot if he was seen. Isabel MacDonald wasn't the only woman to be forced to suffer this brutality. Catherine MacDonald in Noidart was pregnant. She was described in the records as being big with child. Catherine was raped and left on the ground as if for dead. So many other women went through this, who we don't have names for, and so much of it was unreported. When I was reading through the accounts, I, I had such a mixture of emotions. There were tears in my eyes, and I, I was furious. I recognised these places spoken about, and I hate to imagine what these people went through. Elspeth MacPhail in Gask gave birth to a child the Sunday before the battle. She had a son, she named him Alexander. A dragoon, that's one of the mounted infantry troops, picked up Alexander by the leg and threw him about. There's descriptions of wounded people being burnt alive when their homes were set ablaze. They even mention a woman during childbirth burning alive in her home. The men, women and children of the Highlands were brutalised. They were stripped of any useful clothing they had and left with rags. Their livestock were either stolen or driven away or slaughtered. The folks of the Highland were left with nothing, many without shelter, robbed of their livelihoods and their futures and left to beg. I, I really want to give you some kinds of words of hope here. Um, but I'm not sure I can quite muster them. These were tragic and violent times. Many people murdered, raped and enduring a great trauma and dreadful persecutions. But the Gales and the Highlanders, they endured. They kept their culture, they held on to it. I have so much respect for people who are able to keep hold of their culture, something so precious, after experiencing such violence against their whole community. And it's because of these people that endured this and managed to take this treasure with them, their languages and cultures and traditions of the Highlands. These still live on and they are the lifeblood of this place. No amount of persecution from Cumberland's troops made people forget who they are. For me, that is, that is very special. In the months and years after Culloden, the British government tried to decimate the structures of Highland culture and society. The clan chiefs were stripped of their legal powers and Jacobite estates were seized by the crown. The government understood the power of the land. It became forbidden for clansmen to bear weapons and the kilt and tartan were banned from being worn. The Gallic language, already outlawed, became deeply suppressed. English became the only language of power whereas Gaelic was silenced. The butchery of the traditional Gaelic ways of life left many rural communities in crisis, with increasingly unstable and bleak futures. 
the colossal persecutions of Gaelic happened in classrooms over a century after Culloden, where English was established as the language of education and the educated. Gaelic, the native language of the Gaels, the folks of the Highlands, was pushed into the privacy of the home. In school in the Highlands, I remember being taught about the Battle of Culloden and empathy for those men who died. But I was still taught this in English, and Gaelic is something that I later had to learn as an adult. Before I became interested in Scottish history, I had this misconception that Culloden was just another battle that we lost to the English. But Culloden was so much more than that. Its repercussions still ripple through all of Scotland to this day, 275 years on. I grew up on a kind of half croft in Nairn. Nairn is only about 10 miles away from Culloden Battlefield. And so I saw this place and all of its kind of multi-layered meanings to the people that live here, enough to be able to internalize these complex narratives of the battlefield. Well, as much of these narratives that a child or a teenager could understand. I left the Highlands age 17, um, but this, this place has always really suckled at my identity. Moving back to the Highlands was really strange for me, aged about 27, and I still feel kind of simultaneously too close to the trauma of the Highlands, yet strangely alienated from the culture. There's this persistent shame that comes from not having native Gaelic, as though I was born with two tongues and swallowed one, and I have to pay for evening classes to get the Gaelic one back. The desolate battlefield is the artery connecting people to the heritage of the Highlands, it's the final punctuation on the Highland way of life. So much of Highland history is divided with the words before Culloden and after Culloden. I really want to emphasise that the Highlands have a future beyond all of this. I think it's quite easy to see Culloden Battlefield as a site of dark tourism because people go there to remember the tragedies and deaths of 1746. And we shared the stories of trauma that happened across the Highlands because it's important to remember that this whole region was dreadfully persecuted after Culloden. However, this whole land isn't just a place for remembering tragedy. It's a place for people to live and dream and to visit and enjoy and a place where we want to have a future a good future and a happy future that's remembering and respecting the past but also making something that's bright and beautiful and happy for the next generation to honour the people of the Highlands who came before us and who 275 years ago went through torment to be able to just stay in this place. I want to look forward to make this a place where people can have a real future. Now justice for the Highlands means opportunities for people here, for young folks to be able to stay here to have the chance to get a good job and affordable housing. Just these really basic things that mean people can make lives here. Yeah, and I think as someone who has moved up here and is working and making a life up here, I think that it's definitely moving in the right direction. But it's so, so important for people that do come up, like me, with these uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings of the past to learn and to educate ourselves and, and respect the land that we live and work upon. And so we would like to thank you all for listening and remembering the people of the Highlands in the aftermath of Culloden and for sharing our hopes that the Highlands become a place where there's as much of a bright future as there is a tragic past. We'd like to thank everyone who's supported us in making this podcast, especially our Patreons, We'll do some shout outs for new members in the next episode, which is less heartbreaking. And we'll follow Bonnie Prince Charlie as he escaped from the Battle of Culloden and the path that he took. Slangeva. Slangeva.